Hello, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you today as you prepare to welcome visitors from around the world. It's an honor to be with you. I would like to first tell you that I have no conflicts of interest, but I don't think that that's of particular interest to you. And again, as we talk about the American Medical Association, I just want to locate the Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs briefly. We are part of the House of Delegates, part of the governance and policy structure of the AMA, and charged specifically with developing ethics policy for the organization and for American physicians. So some of what I say will be drawing on the code of medical ethics, but I will be looking at sources from around the world as well. And I think one of the things we tend to think about informed consent is that it's a formality, it's a signed document. I want to move us off of that perspective <clears throat> because I believe a more helpful way to think about informed consent is to think about the goal. What are we trying to achieve with informed consent? What is foundational to informed consent rather than it being a regulatory matter? And I think that one of the most powerful things about consent is that it's intended to be a practice that puts into play that foundational notion of respect for patients as persons. It's intended to engage patients in their own care, to give them a voice in decisions. And I want us to think about focusing on that process of engagement, not on a signed document, not on what the regulations will be, not that those aren't important, but that they are not the core of informed consent. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd also like to have us look at briefly the very essential elements of informed consent, because again, when we think about consent in challenging situations, the regulations don't help us enough. But knowing, thinking about what's critical to consent can give us the kind of insight we need. And when we talk about consent, we talk about decision making capacity, the patient's ability to understand and reason about what's at stake for them in this decision, about disclosure, about having the information they need to make a well-considered decision, and then about it being voluntary. It should be their free choice. What I wanna talk about, particularly this morning, in light of your upcoming events and the concerns you have about consent in challenging situations is to look at some of those challenging situations, particularly when patients do not have the capacity to make decisions, how do we proceed? And when public needs compete with individual interests, there are a couple of those that, that we might want to look at. Clinical research is one, public health interventions are another. Another thing we wanna think about is what do we do about consent under emergency situations and consent in cross-cultural settings? I want to focus particularly on the consent under emergency conditions and in cross-cultural settings because I think those will be most germane to your immediate interests. But we do need to talk about decision-making capacity. When a patient is unable to participate in decision-making for whatever reason, they're unconscious, they <laughs> excuse me, are in pain, disoriented, whatever the reason, we try to find a surrogate decision maker to participate on their behalf. Ideally, that will be a person already designated by the patient to make decisions. If there is no designated sur surrogate, a family member or a close personal associate can play that role. And for a patient who's an unemancipated minor, an immature minor, a parent or guardian can play that role. And, <coughs> excuse me. We also want to talk about the standards for surrogate decisions. And there are two of them that we use in the Anglo-American and European tradition, particularly. What the patient would have wanted, how that individual would have decided him or herself. What's called the substituted judgment standard. And Absent that, when there is no knowledge of what the patient would have wanted, or there is no surrogate available to make decisions for the patient, treatment decisions and recommendations should be made on what is clinically most appropriate in the patient's specific situation. So that's the best interest standard. 
and clinicians should always be informing the patient and or surrogate of what they believe is most clinically appropriate, of course. But I think there's also important to remember that decision-making capacity, while it can be fluctuating, while it is decision-specific, a patient can be have the capacity to make one kind of decision, but not another. Patients can make informed refusals and refusal of care is not in and of itself an indication that the patient lacks capacity. If a patient refuses treatment that a physician believes is urgently, especially urgently needed, the physician's responsibility is to try to help the patient think it through, to try and understand why the patient is declining care and to persuade if possible but in the end, a patient has the right to refuse treatment, even life-sustaining treatment, and ultimately a physician must respect that decision in the Anglo-American tradition, certainly. Um, so to think about the notion of public interest competing with that individual right to control what happens with one's own body, to make decisions about care, as I mentioned, there are a couple of different scenarios. Clinical research, I think, is very familiar. I won't go through that particularly today. There is excellent material already available on the Department of Health website that I'm sure you're very familiar with. The two parts that I want to stress that distinguish research consent from other situation treatment consent are that participating in research is not intended to benefit the individual him or herself. It is for the benefit of future patients and that the individual has the right to withdraw at any time without otherwise compromising their care. That said, I think we, we can better serve our immediate interests by looking at questions of public health interventions. And the key to this is thinking about when and how to place restrictions on individual behaviors to prevent harm to the community. And this can be very challenging. I think we've all seen that in the last two years. Certainly in the United States, we have enormous tension around the right to make one's own decisions and things like masking and vaccine mandates. But the general ethics for consent and for public health interventions overall is to use the least restrictive means to achieve the public goal, to make sure that the means that are used are scientifically sound. The vaccines must be well validated, for example. They must pro pro be proportional to the severity or the gravity of the public health risk. For a severe, highly transmissible disease such as COVID-19, more stringent interventions are more ethically justifiable. They do need to be not to be targeted against any particular class or category of persons. And we have seen that kind of stigma and targeting happen in earlier pandemics. We've seen it certainly around HIV. And also, I think this is somewhat neglected much of the time, is that any intervention must be implemented so that it minimizes the potential to exacerbate disparities in care or disparities in access to care. Basically, the question you want to ask yourselves is, what's the worst thing that could happen to the person who is most severely affected by this intervention? And how can we minimize the possibility of that happening? With that in mind as a background, I think another important consideration for you today is thinking about how to handle informed consent under emergency conditions, whether that is a natural disaster, pandemic disease, a mass casualty event, whenever there are going to be multiple persons needing care um, at, and under uncertain conditions and a great deal of, of stress. And again, I think there are two different kinds of scenarios at stake here. One is the matter of providing what is standard accepted treatment under emergency conditions, such as multiple injuries, needing urgent care. And the general rule of thumb on this that's widely recognized in international regulation and ethics is that physicians can initiate treatment without prior informed consent when that treatment is urgently needed to preserve life or function 
and the patient is not able to participate in decision making or the patient surrogate is not available. The notion is protect life first and apologize later if you need to, as it were. But it is important to remember as part of that fundamental commitment to engaging patients that is part of informed consent that when the patient recovers capacity or if the patient recovers capacity or the surrogate becomes available, it's important to tell the individual what treatment has been given on an emergency basis and then obtain their consent to ongoing treatment as needed. So it doesn't end with the with the life-saving intervention. You really do have to follow up with the patient if we are going to achieve that goal of respect. Another situation where consent can be difficult in emergency conditions, but it's rather differently structured, and I think this is one you're less likely to see, is where there is ongoing research into an investigational therapy for an emergent condition. So for example, <clears throat> several, quite several years ago now, the use of streptokinase in emergency departments, um, when there is a narrow window of opportunity to initiate the therapy and have it be successful, but it is not yet a validated therapy. There's no opportunity to get consent either from the patient or from a surrogate who may or may not be available, that you can initiate the therapy. But again, um, once the patient regains capacity, it is important that a clinician review what is what treatment has been given and obtain an individual's agreement to continue that treatment. And I think that those two senses are perhaps the most important to consider when you're talking about consent under emergency, emergency conditions. Protect life and function when needed, when it is urgent that one do so, but then always follow up with the individual. Initiate that process of ongoing consent because our goal is not simply to get treatment offered, but to respect the person in the way we offer that treatment and the way we provide it. And I think with that, we can move on to consent in multicultural settings. And this again is a different kind of challenge, but equally important. And that can be capsulized, I think, by saying that there will be situations in which a clinician's professional obligations and commitment to informed consent, commitment to respecting patient decision making, commitment to respecting the rights of the patient may be in tension with the patient's own cultural, religious, ethnic traditions or beliefs and, and local norms for making decisions. Obviously in the United States, we have a strong tradition of individual decision-making by the patient. In other communities, there may be preferences for other decision-makers and trying to respect those at the same time that one honors one's professional commitments to the patient can be a challenge. I think what the process should be for a clinician is to, to seek solutions that actually respect both the professional commitment and the individual's beliefs and traditions to the extent reasonable without completely violating professional norms, to adhere to local norms, to encourage patients to be involved in decision making, even if that is not the local tradition, but not to force that issue, to allow a patient to choose another decision maker to opt out of the process, as long as the patient has been offered the opportunity to participate in the decision making. And I think a second piece of that puzzle around multicultural settings is when healthcare professionals and patients do not speak the same language. Um, that can be particularly challenging when you have individuals coming together from multiple different communities speaking multiple languages. Um, and while this isn't usually written up in codes of ethics, there is a clear understanding and a clear sort of hierarchy of preferences of who should do interpretation when patients and physicians speak different languages. Always, the ideal is always to have a professional medical interpreter, someone who understands both clinical terminology, 
the process of caregiving and the nature of consent and is fluent both in the physician's native language and the patient's. That's a situation that may be very difficult to realize, especially under emergency conditions and especially when there are multiple languages in play. A second very good option is when there are bilingual healthcare professionals available to assist or even other members of clinical, non-clinical staff who are part of the healthcare system who are truly bilingual, not just sort of kind of okay speakers of a second language, you would not want me trying to translate for you or interpret for you in Spanish, for example. I do speak Spanish, but I don't speak Spanish nearly well enough to be an, an, a competent and appropriate interpreter. I think in some ways you may want to turn to online services for interpretation, which are increasingly available and increasingly sophisticated. The last resort would be to have a member of the patient's family serve as your interpreter. They have the advantage of knowing the patient, but they also have the disadvantage, far more often than not, of having no clinical experience, of being in a distressing situation, having to work with the patient and a physician in an emergency situation, especially. And there can be all kinds of family dynamics at stake. I mean, one of the things we have seen from research in the United States or saw in the recent past was asking children to make decisions on behalf of parents or to serve as interpreters for parents in a way that was totally inappropriate given the child's age and the nature of the parent's medical situation. So family members can be an obvious choice and yet they are rarely, if ever, the best choice. Um, and I think that that covers the kinds of essentials we want to think about in consent. To remember that the goal is to respect the patient as a person, as a moral agent who has beliefs and values that should be honored, to provide the information or offer the information that patient needs, and to do what one can to ensure that the decision is voluntary on the patient's part. With those notions in mind, it becomes, I think, not easy, but more feasible to navigate complex situations where decisions must be made under pressure of time and emergent conditions in ways that I think the regulations just don't give us enough guidance. That said, I would like to refer you to the resources slide also here. Um, all of these entities have excellent resources available, and as I mentioned, they the Department of Health in Doha itself has excellent resources on consent, certain kinds of situations. And I would also be more than happy to respond to questions you may have. And if you could email us at this address, cptinternational at ama-assn.org, we would be happy to respond. And with that, I wish you a very successful conference. And again, thank you for the privilege of being able to speak with you.